you can you, you can start by saying that if you want. Okay, yeah. already. He, I, I'm being directed by Joseph McBride. It, it's an honor. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, okay. So, hello. How are you, Joe? Hi. Good to talk to you. Same here. I'm so pleased. This is the new book. It came out in June of 2018, and I'm glad we're finally getting around to talk about it because it's very much available anywhere books are sold. It's called How Did Lubitsch Do It? We've heard of this something called the Lubitsch Touch, and, and this book explains it at a great great length about what that was that made him so unique and um, and why so many, like so many of his peers, really looked, looked to him, didn't they? Yeah, uh, David Niven, who... <clears throat> Excuse me. It was one of his actors, and I, I got to know David Niven, who was a great wit, uh, good good writer too. He called him the master's master, which I think is a nice description because almost all the directors of that generation looked up to Lubitsch as the best or one of the best, and um, go down the list of um, Ford, uh, Capra, uh, Renoir. Uh, you know, uh, just all all the top directors back then, Hawks, etc. Mm-hmm. They imitated him and they they learned from him. He was um, the, Ford made a great comment that he said something to the effect that we all thought we were just making entertainment. Lubitsch was the only one of us who, who realized we were, we were making art, which is quite a compliment. Mm. And um, I think Ford, you know, knew he was making art too. But uh, there was a tribute to Lubitsch's great craftsmanship and artistry that was so uh, beautiful. They all aspired to it. And his originality, Wells mentioned that. Um, he said he was, uh, there's a wonderful quote from Wells. But Wells said uh, Lubitsch was a giant. He said Lubitsch's talent and originality are stupefying. And Jean Renoir said that Lubitsch invented the modern Hollywood. Quite, quite remarkable tributes. And uh, uh, you know, Wells talking talking about his originality. I think uh, hit on something that uh, you know I tried, as you said, to define the Lubitsch touch in this book. That's more than 500 pages long, and that shows you how difficult it is to define it because it's an evanescent term, or another word that Andrew Saris used about Lubitsch's style was ineffable. And um, when I was talking to Jim Naramore, uh, a good scholar, he and I were talking about Lubitsch a few years ago, and he said, "Well." It's really hard to write about him because he's ineffable, isn't he? And I thought about that a lot. And, you know, it's hard to put your finger on the style, but that's part of what the point of the style is. It's it's a subtlety, and it's uh, it's not something that's obvious uh, by definition. It's avoiding the cliché, as Truffaut put it, another great admirer of Lubitsch. Uh, he said Lubitsch would do anything possible to avoid the cliché. And he would rack his brain. He said he bled himself white and died 20 years too early because he was racking his brain to think of ways to tell stories in an original way. And he would say to, Lubitsch would say to his favorite screenwriter, Samson Rafelson, um, in his German accent, he'd say, how did he do it? Without, but how did he say this without saying that? You know, In other words, uh, let, let's get a point across, but not do it the obvious way. And they, they would um, always look for a different angle, different approach, a different oblique method oblique is obliqueness is, is the key to his method um they would show people reacting to something instead of showing the thing actually happening part of it was the response to censorship because in those days there were certain things you could not show but being a subtle guy he wouldn't have wanted to show people rolling around in bed anyway i mean that's not all that dramatically interesting so what's more interesting is what goes on in your, your mind when you see the closed door door shots were big part of the style and it makes you think and makes you participate in, in the film and uh, makes the audience lean in as they will yeah. off yeah, yeah yeah because when you described him as like or actually I guess you were paraphrasing one of the great directors about calling him uh, the first great modern director was that Wells? Mm, that, is I that... don't remember that quote exactly but uh, Renoir said he invented Renoir. the modern Hollywood okay I was that because of the set that... The undertone, the sexual undertone often, or he tried to, as you said, he cleverly conceal it, I guess, you know, and, and, and make it very difficult for the censors to uh, know what to do, right? Yeah, they, one they, of the censors said, I, I think this is kind of a key to Lubitsch's art, he said, we know what he's saying, but we don't know how he's saying <laughs> yeah, it, I love so we that. can't cut it. <laughs> and that was part yeah. of the reason he did it that way, so he couldn't 
be caught, although he did have a few run-ins with censors, but uh, they, they actually, you know, they were smart enough to admire his cunning and cleverness in getting around censorship, And uh, but he got away with some pretty remarkable things. Des- Designed for Living is a kind of a mind-blowing film today. It's about a menage a trois, and it's very obvious that, mm-hmm. you know, three people are together, and at the end of the film, they're all together in one shot, and riding off into the night together, and uh, it makes no bones about it, and uh, Molly Haskell said it that kind of demolishes every uh, uh, canon of respectability, uh, even bohemian respectability. And so he was, um, he, he would he would do clever things that would, would play games with the censors, and the audience was complicit in this. They kind of knew the rules. Mm-hmm. And, okay, let's see how much you can say without hitting people over the head with it. And, um, for example, the opening of Trouble in Paradise, which is my favorite Lubitsch film, I think it's the perfect romantic comedy. Mm-hmm. He and Ray Wilson spent three days trying to think of the opening, and it's a romantic film taking place in Venice, and so the cliche is to start with a beautiful shot of the Grand Canal and gondola going through the canal. Instead, he started with a um, garbage can and a dog, and it looks very grubby. It could be anywhere, and then the heavy set garbage man comes in and lifts out the can and uh, then he walks the camera pans over to the canal and you, you see the canal then and he dumps the garbage into a gondola a garbage gondola <laughs> and then you <laughs> see the whole canal a long shot with a beautiful the light canal. And, you know it's not the usual uh, way of starting with the, the long shot and going you know it's, it's starting with the detail then gradually revealing the setting I notice he does that a lot in different ways if he's uh if a film takes place in a castle, he doesn't usually start the film with a long shot of the castle and move in like most directors do. He will start with some detail or, or some other scene and then gradually show you the surroundings. And uh, But that was more fun and more clever. And and it makes a point because he's undercutting romance and sort of mocking conventional ideas of romance and trouble in paradise. And, and um, by showing garbage... Uh, and then he cuts back to it at a certain point in the middle of a love scene. He cuts, cuts back to the garbage gondola going down the canal. With the, and the, the canal, the, 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 the garbage man is sitting there, oh, solo mio, you know, right. <laughs> which is kind of a cliche, but it means, oh, oh my sunshine, which is ironic because it's at night. So it's a, it really clever, but it took him three days to think of that opening. Which, you know, we don't really, we take sort of for granted, but at the time especially, nobody knew how to wrap their mind around that. That was just yeah, conf- he, confusing and yet compelling, right, wouldn't you say? Yeah, he was, for he was groundbreaking. I think what Renoir had in mind partly was, um, <laughs> excuse me, that uh, when Lubitsch came to America in 1922 from Germany, where he was uh, the leading director in Germany, he's probably the only director who's been the leading director in two different countries. Right. Um, American films were still pretty Victorian. Um, it was the early time. Uh, D.W. Griffith was still going strong, and he was mm-hmm. the great director of the early period. And he had a Victorian sensibility about sexuality, uh, among other things. And Lubitsch comes along with a very cosmopolitan European viewpoint and treated sex in a much more adult fashion. And that's partly why they brought him to Hollywood. He had made Madame du Barry about the French Revolution, which is a very racy film. And uh, Hollywood thought, oh, the guy can make a, a big epic you know, spectacle, but with a kind of a modern sexual sensibility. And you know, after World War I, when people were disillusioned by the war and everything was changing and women were getting liberated and getting to vote and um, people, people's sexual mores were loosening up and their attitudes were loosening and Lubitsch came along right at that point and he showed Hollywood the way of how to deal with sex in an adult way and it, be funny about it. Well, it was the He was living in Berlin, right? Uh, what, that's where he was based in Germany? Yeah. And he, he was, was that during Weimar, Weimar Germany? Was it Weimar Germany? <laughs> Yeah, the Weimar period after yeah, so. World War I, uh, which went till Hitler took over in 33. Right. But Lubitsch, as Billy Wilder, who was one of his top acolytes, said, uh, he kind of joked a dark joke. He said uh, he was one of the talented ones who was brought over instead of having to flee, like Wilder himself had to flee. Right. Many, many hundreds of people came over as refugees and enriched Hollywood with their talents. But Lubitsch was uh, at the forefront because they brought him over and uh, they were trying to. As Hollywood often does, you know, buy off uh, uh, another film industry. And kind of, they brought Murnau over soon after that, and Fritz Lang came over. And but 
Ed Lubitsch had the longest and most successful career of the German imports. That's ironic, considering he died in his mid-50s in 1947. 47, yeah. yeah. Quite a long time ago. And before, you know, before, uh, one reason he was sort of neglected, and, you know, it's one reason I wrote the book was, uh, you know, he wasn't around to give interviews like a lot of the old directors were. And when I came to Hollywood in the 70s, I made it my business to interview everybody I admired, and it's most amazing. of them were around, you know. I was going to say, Ford, this is a, maybe your first, Hutt. this is maybe your first biography that where you didn't meet your subject. Is that? Is that um, yeah, you know, that's true. Of the three that I've done, Ford, Spielberg and Capra, I met them. Spielberg, I met only twice, um, but I met him when he was 27. Ernst Lubitsch left such a mark, and he died so young, but it seemed like his mark was left more on the industry than, let's say, on moviegoers. I mean, what's wonderful is you're in- hopefully introducing, as maybe the Turner Classic Movie Channel has, Ernst Lubitsch to a large larger audience potentially anyway yeah you know because he just never had the maybe it's just the sheer amount of years i don't know well back in his day he was almost a household name as much as any director was there wasn't as much awareness but there were a few people like say hitchcock and capra whose names became pretty well known to the public and it partly had to do with how good a self-publicist you were and those guys were great at that but lubitsch was known to the public his name was sort of a brand and uh they kind of knew that it stood for sophisticated comedy, and he really created like, the like romantic Noel comedy Coward. genre. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I, Claudette Colbert, who I interviewed, said that before uh, it happened one night that Capra made in 1934, they called it high comedy. They didn't call it romantic comedy. There was a, that term wasn't being used that much, but Lubitsch created the earliest examples of what we now consider the romantic comedy in its classic form. It, there was a film called The Marriage Circle in 1924, which is a wonderful silent film. Extremely sophisticated story of uh, uh, a couple and their marital problems, and uh, very funny, and it was ver- tremendously influential on all kinds of directors. Hitchcock and Douglas Sirk and other directors said they learned so much Michael Powell, so he got into the industry because of that film. And, yeah, he had a tremendous effect on other directors, but the public knew who Lubitsch okay. was, and they loved, they loved his films. And he also helped create the musical. Before him, musicals were pretty much um, reviews where uh, people would sing and dance on the stage, and then there'd be a right. story going on. But he integrated song and dance and music in ah. um, The Love Parade in 1949. He wasn't the only one. There was um, King Vito did Hallelujah that year, and Mamoulian did Applause, but Lubitsch made a string of musicals that really defined the musical genre and, and, and the public was tremendously pleased and uh, uh, you know a lot of directors would copy these things and imitate them so they knew who Lubitsch was I think he became kind of forgotten over the years um, it was hard to see his films too and that was one of the reasons I wrote this book I mean I usually write a book because I'm bothered by some kind of injustice or oversight and I want to correct it I mean um you know, and so with Lubitsch, I felt he's been kind of ignored. You don't hear about him in film schools very much, and people aren't writing much about him. There aren't very many books about him compared to, say, Hitchcock. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the nice things about doing the book, How Did Lubitsch Do It, is a lot of people have come out of the closet, so to speak, as Lubitsch fans or come up to me or send me emails or whatever and say, oh my God, I'm such a Lubitsch fan and I'm so thrilled you wrote this book. And Lubitsch's daughter, Nicola, who I've gotten to know well, she's a wonderful, uh, very terrific lady. Mm -hmm. She said, this is the book I've been waiting for all my life. She was so thrilled that somebody wrote a book like this, really appreciating her father and going into detail. Uh, You know, I mean, it's a long book because he had a long, rich career. And so I, I tried to see all these films and, um, he made 72 films, of which 49 survived in whole or in part, and that's a pretty good survival record for somebody from his from era, because a lot of silent films have been lost, but, sure. um, you know, some, some films I'd love to see have been lost, but other ones keep turning up, you know, and um, some have been restored recently. The Museum of Modern Art restored Rosita and Forbidden Paradise, which were only available in really awful prints for a long time. And a lot of his... Um, Early American films are hard to see even now. A lot of his films have never been released on DVD or Blu-ray or VHS in this country. And there, some of the German films that are terrific have never been released in America, except they pop up on YouTube, for example. There's one called 
called Evil Daughters, which I would recommend people look up. Mm -hmm. It's a very hilarious sex farce made in Germany in 1920. It's just wonderful. Never released in America. They thought, I guess, it was too German, but it's just funny. It's a wonderful tour de force with uh, Henny Porton, who is a famous German actress, playing a double role. She's great. Um, but a lot of these films, you know, when I started uh, in the 60s, I saw Trouble in Paradise, it was the first women's film I saw, and I thought, I've just seen this guy's masterpiece because I thought, yeah. how could anybody top this? And I actually still feel that because I've seen everything else um, uh, since then, but I still think it's his perfect film. It's his best film, but he, he made a number of other terrific films, and uh, but I wanted to see them in a selfish way, too. I, I just wanted an excuse to go to Europe and see these films. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when you do a book, you... Um, I mean, I did this one on my own and then sold it to Columbia University Press later, but so I was kind of self-financing this. But um, I went to Europe three times, went to Germany twice and Switzerland once. Uh, they actually flew me over there to curate a Lubitsch retrospective at the um, Locarno Film Festival in, 19, mm -hmm. in 2010. And that was great because they got the best prints from all over Europe and in some cases America, so I got to see all the films in 35 millimeter, the best prints we could get, which was fabulous, and I introduced a lot of them, and, and Nikola Lubitsch came over there, and I got mm -hmm. to meet her, and uh, you know, and then collectors send me copies of films that are hard to get, and because uh, when you do a book, you have to see the films over and over again, you can't just see them once, you know. Of course, right. Yeah. So uh, that's that's been you know a dream come true for me to see all these films and to share my enthusiasm and hope that other people will get inspired. And I'm very happy that some people write me and say, you know, since I got your book, I've been inspired to have a Lubitsch festival, and I'm watching more and more on YouTube or buying DVDs or. And then, as you say, uh, GCM shows some filmstruck before they went to Funk at 13 Lubitsch films. It's a shame that that went away, but Criterion is coming back with a new streaming channel and they have a number of limited films oh well i was going to say warner brothers is going to also have a streaming platform and i'm sure all that tcm because they, they kind of bifurcated i mean they were kind of paired up which might have been a slightly odd to some might have thought of it as an odd pairing meaning tcm and criterion because they sort of have different brands in a way you know not in a way they do yeah. and now because then when warner brothers got bought by at and I guess they just you know they just decided they're gonna do their own streaming platform. So I think we'll 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 get all the stuff on whatever that yeah, becomes. Are, and then then the Warner's has it. They've never released. I don't know why. For example, there's a Lubitsch film from the twenties called Three Women, which is not terrific, but it's it's a good silent film. And Warner's made it, and I don't know why it's never been released on DVD. Sounds like um, a John John film. Ford movie. What? Sounds like a uh, John Ford title. That's seven women and three outlaws, but anyway. Well, Robert Altman made a film about three women, too. <laughs> That's true. But, but actually, a, a better film that Warner's made in 1925, Lady Windermere's Fan, the Lubitsch film, which is a masterpiece. It's, it's not that, you can get that on one of those box sets of treasures from the American, what's it called, from the American Film Archives. And it's a beautiful, beautiful print, well-preserved, but um, you have to buy it as part of the set. And... Uh, so this is Paris is another film that Warner's made that uh, I had a I have a tape of it that came out some years ago, but it was restored recently. We showed it at UCLA, and Nikola Lubitsch uh, came with me, and we introduced it. She'd never seen it; she was delighted by it. It's a wow. very funny, charming late silent film. But they haven't released that on DVD. The, uh, there was a terrific box that Tino Lorber Tino Lorber put out a set of five. Uh, German films of Lubitsch and a documentary about Robert Fischer, and that's highly recommended because he made some fantastic films in Germany, uh, Oyster Princess and I Don't Want to Be a Man, etc. You know, wonderful mm -hmm. films. You know, it's, you're reminding me, and I'm, I guess I'm going to gear up as I start, as I'm, I'm working my way through the Lubitsch book. One thing I love doing is, like I did with your John Ford book, is to go back and revisit as well as finally see a lot of stuff. And for somebody like John Ford, you know, other than I imagine some of the some of the silent films, the early silent films that he made, so much is available, and it just becomes this fantastic experience to be reading such a thorough historic book about him and be able to see and watch the films again. Yeah, with Ford, there are about ninety-five films that survived. He made one hundred and thirty-seven as a director. 
John. A lot mm-hmm. of the silence are lost, unfortunately, but 25 silence now exists. Uh, some are just part. But when I started researching Ford in the 60s, I wrote a book called John Ford with Mike Wellington, a critical yep. study, and there were only 12 Ford silence available then. So 13 have turned up in the last 50 years, uh, which how, is wonderful. And, and how recently have the, the last one or two shown up? Well, um, I think up. the last one was upstream, which uh, there was a big find in New Zealand at the National Film Archive there. A UCLA scholar was down there, and uh, somebody at the archive said, we got a whole bunch of American films that some, some guy had. I think he was a projectionist, too. That was sort of the end of the road, Australia and New Zealand, for American films in those days, and they just wouldn't send them back because oh, it's it wasn't expensive. worth was it? Yeah. We're shipping these nitrate films back, so they just threw them away. But this guy took them home, and he had um, unique prints of uh, uh, films. There was a film that Hitchcock worked on called Woman to Woman. And a lot of American films have turned up. Some you can see online now, but Upstream was a silent Ford film uh, about theater people, which is quite charming. Mm-hmm. And that that was in good shape, and um, so they restored that and released it. And uh, But th- there was... There's some short films of Ford. Let's just remind people, again, of your, your newest book, which is, I guess, uh, it is approaching, like this spring it'll be approaching. It's the one year that it's been out, but it's a, it's called How Did Lubitsch Do It? And it's uh, written by Joseph McBride and published by Columbia University Press. Yep. And, and um, it's available wherever books are sold. And it is one of a, many of uh, your books. This ended up the reverse of how I intended it, but... It couldn't have gone any better. What I would love to do at you know when when it makes sense, do I am so fascinated because I just came off of reading the John Ford book. You know, first of all, I feel like after reading that book, all seven hundred fifty plus pages, that I, I was I really felt like I, I this guy was alive. I mean, I come after after reading it, I miss him. I miss him. You know, I miss him. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, he came to life, and so I want to talk about it because he's so complicated a guy. So, like some yeah. of the, like so many of these other guys that we're talking about. So, That's but a great but subject and hard, enigmatic character. Yeah. That's why it took me a long time to do that book, and I, I'm very happy and, with it. And you really, but he's you, not an easy man to understand, but I, you know, I, no. he's endlessly fascinating as are his films. No, but I want to explore it with you. But I, I want to come back, and I, I think this is a great place to end this particular conversation, but I do want to come back and do something special for John, on John Ford. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you. And, uh,